Hello. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Good afternoon and very, very warm welcome to the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament. <clears throat> My name is Annabel Ewing and I am a Deputy Presiding Officer of the Parliament and my job is to try to keep <clears throat> the politicians in good order, <laughs> which uh, is met with very degrees of success, I have to confess. Um, but this, of course, is our Festival of Politics. This is the 19th year uh, of the festival. And it's really encouraging to see that uh, the events are still so well subscribed. <clears throat> I think it's a really good formula for people to come in and listen to debates on different subjects and inform themselves and, of course, get to ask the questions that are important to them. Um, I will explain in, in a wee while how you all can get involved in the conversation today, but I think without further ado, I should introduce our special guest this afternoon, and that, of course, is the Right Honourable Michael Pertillo. What about a round of applause? Sir? <laughs> so, uh, Michael is probably well known to you as a former Conservative MP, but uh, for many of you, he is likely to be as equally well known as a broadcaster and journalist uh, with his hugely successful Great Railway Journeys of Great Britain, uh, a TV programme that's now, I believe, in its 14th season. So I think it would be difficult to imagine anybody who has not managed to catch some of those fabulous programmes. <clears throat> what may be less well known is that Michael's late mother, Cora, uh, was a linguist and a political activist. Uh, Cora was Scots and hailed from Fife. And, of course, Michael spent many happy times visiting his, his family and his grandparents in Kirkcaldy. Michael's father, Luis, was a Spanish law professor who was forced to leave Spain <coughs> for exile in England after the Spanish Civil War, where he had supported the Republicans. <coughs> Michael, a Cambridge First Class Honours History graduate and sometime Conservative Party researcher, fought and won the Enfield Southgate by-election in December 1984, following the murder of the sitting MP, Sir Anthony Berry, uh, in the bombing of the Grand Hotel in Brighton during the Conservative Party conference that year. Michael was promoted to minister and then cabinet secretary, and his tenure covered a number of portfolios, including transport, chief secretary to the treasury, employment and defence. Michael famously, <coughs> or perhaps infamously, excuse me, did not survive the Labour landslide in 1997, but was soon back in the House of Commons in November 1999, following a by-election in Kensington and Chelsea uh, the, after the passing of Alan Clark. Michael held that seat at the following 2001 UK general election, but he stood down at the 2005 election. Michael has continued with his prolific broadcasting output with railway journeys in other continents attracting his attention, he has a Sunday slot on GB News and many other <coughs> programmes besides. And, of course, his, his time in uh, broadcasting included, I think, about a 15-year stint on the This Week programme, <coughs> excuse me, um, hosted by Andrew Neil, a quite irreverent look at politics. And, of course, a co-presenter was Diane Abbott, Labour MP. So, without further ado, what I will do is uh, perhaps pose some questions to Michael and then throw it open to the audience to put their questions. So, perhaps the key question, Michael, on everybody's lips is, uh, from your perspective, what is the most epic real journey that you have experienced? Um, well, first of all, may I say that I'm delighted to be here. I love visiting parliaments, um, and um, I do that both privately and as part of my railway journey. And I visited this parliament a number of times to film and to do other things. Uh, I am in perhaps, uh, well, no, perhaps a growing minority because I've always liked the architecture of this building. Uh, I've always thought that an institution of this quality needed to have a really important building. And it was likely that it was going to be an expensive building and it was likely that it was going to overrun. But in the fullness of time, it seemed to be extremely important that uh, this institution should have 
a really remarkable building, which is what it is. And so I'm very thrilled to be back in here. And I hope you feel excited too about being in the chamber. Perhaps you're in the chamber a lot, but I am not. And I'm very, very pleased to be here. So um, it's very difficult for me to say what my most epic journey has been. I have I've now filmed for, this is the 15th year we're filming. And we have filmed on five continents. And we've made hundreds of programs. Uh, we can't even count the number of series we've made, let alone the numbers of programs. And I have just enjoyed every single one of them and every minute. This is where I normally risk great unpopularity by declaring that I don't think my programs are about train journeys. I think they're about everything else in a way. They're about the people I meet on the way. They're about history. They're about culture. They're, um, yeah, those are the things that they're about. So. I must confess that to me, the journey is, um, the physical journey, the train journey, is secondary. Um, the, the, the train is a vehicle, both in the metaphorical and the literal sense. It is the way I get around. My passion is about history. But since you press me, uh, and uh, even an ex-politician has to have an answer, I would, I would mention perhaps that I think Georgia was a country, the one that's south of Russia, not the American state, is a country that I absolutely recommend to you. Extraordinary people, um, so welcoming, uh, so, so hospitable, so in love with food, so in love with wine. I think, every, I think every Georgian makes wine. Even if they live in a tiny flat, there'll be a plastic bucket in the shower where they're making wine. The men in particular sing wonderfully. There are tea plantations and superb mountains. They have a literature of their own, they have an alphabet of their own, a language of their own. Of course, they've resisted Russia over centuries. They're an intensely Christian country and a, a Muslim enclave of the world. They're the most tenacious and fascinating people. And perhaps the one other I would mention is um, Alaska. Uh, and again, it's not about the journey as much as about the people. But, you know, I suppose throughout my life trying to understand history, one of the things I've tried to understand is the American frontier, you know, what we used to call how the West was won. Well, if you want to understand the people and the mentality, you go now to Alaska, because Alaska is full of self-selecting people who probably come from the rest of the United States. And they're the sort of people who want to live two miles from the nearest human being and don't mind living in perpetual darkness during winter months and relish their next encounter with a bear. Um, absolutely amazing people but if you want to understand you know what it was that drove the european origin settlers to the west and to to you know tame that country well you find that spirit still in alaska today thank you Matt. i mean like, it's very interesting that you see that the the train is kind of well, literally the vehicle it's it's the the, the the embarkation point it's where you get off your initial destination and the stories around that um, but I wonder if that was in your mind at all, and this is something the audience may not know, when I was doing my research um, for today, I had not realised that Michael, when he was Transport Minister under Margaret Thatcher, her government, that he actually saved a railway line. And I have to say, sadly, that that's not something I think that many people uh, equate with politicians these days, actually saving things, but hopefully we'll see perhaps more of that in the future. But the railway line in question was the settle to Carlisle, uh, railway line and, and perhaps Michael you could um, recall that time as Transport Minister and, and the, the issues you were dealing with and how you managed to win the day over British Rail because they weren't in the, in, minded to save it as far as I can see. Well <clears throat> when, when I was asked some years after I'd left politics what was my greatest achievement in politics I, I said without hesitation saving the settled Carlisle railway line which people were rather surprised about because you know, they think we're going to say something, as it were, bigger, uh, but, uh, but I did not. So, I mean, the circumstances were that this was in the late 1980s, and uh, British Rail was nationalized, and British Rail was making big losses, and there was pressure from the Conservative government, to which I was a member, on British Rail to reduce its losses. And so British Rail said, ha ha, one way we can reduce our losses is by closing the loss-making settled Carlisle railway line. However, Conservatives were not only in those days interested in profit and loss accounts, they were also interested in heritage. So this was, this was a conundrum. Uh, as Conservatives, we wanted to see 
the Settle Carlisle uh, line lose less money, we want to see British Rail lose less money. On the other hand, we didn't want to close what was clearly a, um, a, a very important part of the national heritage. So the first thing I would say is that my predecessor as the minister, David Mitchell, Andrew Mitchell's father, um, said to me as he handed over, he said, the one thing you have to do in this job is to save the Settle Carlisle railway line. So my, my card had been marked. And the way that it happened was that there was a marvellous organisation called the Friends of the Settled to Carlisle Railway, with a capital F, um, and these people wanted to make sure that the railway was not closed. And um, as the possibility of closure approached, they sort of organised a closing down sale. They said, you know, you must travel on the railway before it closes. So suddenly the number of people travelling zoomed up to 350,000 or something. And then one of the big issues was the Ribblehead Viaduct needed repair and it was uh, budgeted at nine million. And a wonderful engineer arrived who said, oh, no, I can do it for three million. Well, you know, six million in those days um, was real money. So between the fare box going up and the cost of repair going down, I was able to say to British Rail, you haven't made the case for closure. And so happy outcome. And all of that was about hmm, 32 years ago, I think. And, and I still go to um, commemoration services because <laughs> Uh, uh, amazingly, the, the people who, were ca who campaigned at the time, many of them are still alive. They must have been, you know, youths at the time. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, we, we continue to celebrate that. And a, a word of history is that the Settled Carlisle was the last of the railway lines to be built between England and Scotland. So there was already an East Coast main line, there was already a West Coast main line. But the... Um, someone would know this better than I, was at the Midland Railway operating out, operating out of St Pancras in those days, wanted to uh, have competition. So they built this extraordinarily difficult line, extraordinarily difficult, straight through the, straight through the uh, mountains, if you can call them that, of northern England. And um, so it was a spectacular line, but it was always a difficult line, has difficulty with snow in the winter and so on and so on. But um, thank, goodness, thank goodness it has been saved. So it was my greatest achievement, but my goodness... Um, only because I was the man who managed to sign the bit of paper. Lots of other people were involved in saving it. Yes, I, I think you were the, the, had the honour of, of becoming the president of the Friends of the, the yes, Railway Line. I yes, believe I still am. Oh, yes. you still are? Well, it's uh, good to remind you of my, your My president is I'm not onerous. <laughs> I, I, and it, you know, it's interesting because I understand that you actually insisted on commissioning your own evidence, your own research, and... And that's important because, you know, as a minister, you will get lots of bits of information crossing your desk. And I guess if, if you're minded not to interrogate that very much, then you really don't, well, don't get very much out of it, perhaps. You know all this debate that we have today about, you know, civil servants and whether they take positions and all this sort of thing. So I said, I have to travel on this line, but of course I must travel incognito. So I think I, I, think I traveled up overnight and stayed in a hotel in order to get on a train at 6 a.m., uh, I think going from Carlisle down to Settle, if I recall. So I arrive at the station at 6 a.m. The station is thronged with members of the public <laughs> because, because there's been a leak, um, which must have come from my department. So, yes, I tried to do my own research in a discreet way, uh, but I wasn't helped uh, to, 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 to be, towards being discreet. It brings to mind um, a quote that I, I noted. I read uh, a part of your book. I've got the other bits to read. The History of Hidden Britain, I think that had been a successful Channel 5 TV series looking at history and culture and developments through the lens of uh, abandoned, empty buildings and other bits of infrastructure. But I think in that book you said that for a politician to be overburdened with scepticism is not necessarily a good thing. But I wonder, in the present day, whether actually uh, a bit more scepticism from politicians might indeed be a good thing in terms of policy delivery. I don't know if you've got any thoughts. Well, <coughs> uh, perhaps, first of all, I should explain my remarks. So um, I, I read history at Cambridge, and if I were asked what I learnt learning history at Cambridge, I would say um, I learnt scepticism, because the historian or at least a history student should always be asking how do we know this you know this was probably written down by someone or this was filmed by someone who who wrote it down who filmed it what was their agenda are we sure that this is a full view of the things that happened so you're constantly being skeptical about uh, evidence 
And, and I do indeed think that has been a most useful thing to be in life, and I certainly applied it in my politics. But when I say that skepticism is not useful, it is that at the end of the day, you have to say 20 ridiculous things before breakfast every day and pretend to believe them. You know, what, 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 whatever it is, we are going to build 40 hospitals or, you know, we, we are going to stop the boats um, <coughs> and whatever it was in my days. So you have to say all these things all the time, knowing that it's most unlikely that that will be achieved in each case. Um, and this is not because politicians are evil, in my view. See, the thing is that in the United Kingdom, to form a government, you're aiming to get about 42, 43, 44% of the vote. Well, that's a very large chunk of the population. And no two people agree, let alone the 44% who voted for you. So when, you, when you're governing, or even when you're in opposition, you are handling an immense coalition of different views. And what you have to do, therefore, to, to to form a government, for example, or indeed to form an opposition, is you have to arrive at positions in common. So, you know, the manifesto you sign up to is a position in common. It isn't what I believe, wouldn't be what you believe. It's what we've decided together to say in order to be coherent. And I reckon if you ran a golf club, uh, it would be much the same. You've got to come together with, to have certain policies you know, about who can be members and, you know, what, what time you can tee off. Even if it's not, even if the, the position you arrive at is very much disagreed about by some people. So having agreed to say these things, you go off and you say these things. Now, you don't exactly believe them, but you think it is necessary and you think it is right because other, other, otherwise your party, your government, your golf club isn't coherent. So I don't think this is wrong and I don't think it's deceitful but it's certainly a great strain. And one of the reasons I left politics is I've, I found after a while the strain of collective responsibility was not one I wanted to continue to, in, to endure. Interesting answer. Um, it's very difficult to second guess times in one's life, but I'm going to seek for you to reflect a bit. If you had held your seat in 1997, what, what do you imagine your life would have been? Would there have been time for a great railway journey TV programmes? Would there have been time for all the additional broadcasting activity you have carried on? Or perhaps there wouldn't have been, but perhaps in the offing might have been being UK Conservative Prime Minister. Do you reflect on, on that at all, Michael? Um. You probably won't agree, uh, sorry, you probably won't believe what I'm about to say. But um, two moments of joy in my life were when I lost my seat uh, at Enfield Southgate and when I failed to win the Conservative leadership in 2001. How can this possibly be the case? Because in 1997, when I lost my seat, I knew that the Conservatives were going down to a very, very heavy defeat. And I thought that the Conservatives would be in opposition for 10 or 15 years, which, of course, turned out to be true. Um, it was highly predictable. And so had I won my seat, I would have been expected to stand for the leadership of the Conservative Party. I might have won. And if I had, I would have had the most miserable experience <laughs> possible, trying to, trying to govern this rump of a party which had just been defeated, uh, which was, of course, very much divided. And above all, that had no credibility. Um, because when you've just been booted out of office, nobody cares what you say. They know you're not going to be there for the next five years, probably 10, and possibly 15 years. So why should anyone listen to you? So when you're a government minister, you have automatic credibility because you're the government minister. When you're in opposition, you have no credibility. And that's just about bearable if you're starting out as a youngster, but it's unbearable if you've been in office for 11 years, as I had been, you know, struggling every day to have credibility. So, um, and, and it's rather similar about 2001. I was persuaded to run for the leadership. I returned in a by-election, as you've heard before. I was persuaded to run for the leadership. It was a poor decision, in my view. Luckily, I didn't win it. And when I didn't win it, I gave a whoop of pleasure. Um, <laughs> 
Why? Because uh, I was not a vanilla candidate. And the Conservative Party, it has a mad electoral system. And we've seen the consequences of its mad electoral system uh, several times since. So typically, the person who wins the leadership of the Conservative Party has the support of a third or just over a third of the members of parliament. Or another way of putting it is that person lacks the support of two thirds of the parliamentary party. And that's at the beginning. So uh, after that, you go on losing support. I mean, it is a miserable situation. When I might have become um, leader of the opposition, a uh, little bit, yes, when I might have won the Conservative leadership, in fact, it was won by Ian Duncan Smith. And after two years, you know, he was knifed in the back and he was out. So, um, what was the question? Um, well, yes, it's just the road less travelled. Do you, I know, I'm, I'm do you just, reflect on, on any I'm, bit I'm, of that that you might have wanted to remain part of? Or you're, no, I'm just delighted with the way you're things You're delighted. Out, <laughs> no, no, I, I seriously am. I can't believe how lucky I've been. Um, you know, when you're, when you're a member of the UK Parliament, um, you do worry about what you're going to do next. If I can give you a, a simile, I remember once sitting at dinner next to a bank manager, and I said to him, oh, you know, tell me about your life. And he said, I used to be a Spitfire pilot in the Second World War uh, when I was 20 years old. I said, oh, yeah. And he said, and the rest of my life has been so dull. <laughs> I felt so sorry for him. Yeah. Uh, but it's the, this is the problem with being in Parliament. It is so exciting. But what, happened, what do you do next? So, you know, one of my friends became the president of the Cats Society, uh, another person who'd been a member of parliament became the, um, the CEO of a company that organises uh, hoardings, posters on street corners, you know, after being a member of parliament. And I was so frightened that, you know, I wouldn't find anything to do after the excitement of being a member of parliament. And I'm so lucky that I've, you know, had the, this career in broadcasting, which I have found just as exciting, actually. Is there anything from your time in frontline politics that you, you still actively miss? Any particular issue? Any no. Matter? No? <laughs> well, that's quite unequivocal. Um, and very refreshingly honest. Um, because, of course, it is. Uh, it's, um, yes, there are many challenges to being a frontline politician, and I think that's fair to say. Looking at the, the political landscape we have now in terms of, in the context of the 24-hour media cycle and the double whammy of social media, could you imagine yourself applying your political trade in that context? Because, of course, the challenges are just, you know, vastly multiplied on a daily basis as to how politicians, um, you know, get through each day, really. Well, uh, first of all, to point out the obvious, that I was last in politics in 2005 when this technology simply did not exist. Um, when I ceased to be a minister in 1997, I had never sent an email. And that's how much the um, technology has changed. Um, so I, I do find it hard to imagine. I mean, on the one hand... Um, I think some of the whinging is not justified because, for example, when I was a member of parliament, I think I had, I had a secretary and I had an assistant. Now, members of parliament have, you know, seven or eight in their office. They get an allowance of about 180,000 or I think 200,000 if, they if, if, if they're based in London, or sorry, if their constituency is London, uh, for which they get, you know, about seven members of staff. And so, you know, on social media, someone is running their social media for them, uh, fielding all the stuff that's coming in, turning it around. And, of course, social media also offers great opportunities for members of parliament to self-publicise. You know, my only opportunity, really, was to do something photogenic <coughs> over the weekend and get in the two local newspapers, um, <coughs> you know, hoping that this would lead to a photograph uh, in the local newspaper. Now, of course, you, you know, you can... You can promote yourself. So social media, I think, presents a lot of advantages for members of parliament. <coughs> but what I will say is this, that one of the reasons I'm glad I didn't go further is that I am quite thin-skinned. And, <laughs> and I, I, I mean, the, the, the horrors that people write on social media about members of parliament and about everyone else, it's just, just appalling. 
I mean, the, the two situations in life where somehow civilization breaks down, it's like Lord of the Flies, is one, social media, and secondly, um, sort of road rage. I mean, I don't know why a windscreen between one person and another <coughs> means that they can start screaming abuse at you uh, as a pedestrian or another motorist or whatever. But, um, social media appears to be the same. Uh, I mean, people write the most vile things. I'm, I'm not in, uh, in social media at all, but I do notice that every now and again I get a rather sort of vicious email, maybe about one of my programs, and I write back politely, and then the email comes back saying, oh, it was so lovely of you to reply. Yes, I just... <laughs> that, that the tone has changed completely, but people are absolutely irresponsible on social media. Um, and I do think uh, you know, a lot of people find it wearing. They find it wearing for themselves, they find it very wearing for their families, uh, for, their, for, their, for their spouse, for their children. Horrible. Um, I, hard, I hardly know, in fact, I could hard, I, I was struggling to remember na her name, you'll laugh at this. I hardly know Liz Truss, um, but I <laughs> bumped into her <coughs> the other day at a party, and she was there with her husband, she was there with her two lovely teenage daughters. I thought, oh my goodness, these two girls have been through the ringer with her. And I can't remember what, somebody said something about politics, and they both said, Whoa. just like that, two teenage girls. Well, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. One last question before I, I throw uh, yourself open to the audience, so to speak. Um, <laughs> when I was doing my research, I wasn't surprised to note that your mother, your late mother, Cora, was a political activist. What I had found a bit surprising to find out was that initially her political activism fell uh, very much on the side of the Labour Party. And I just wondered, did that lead to many heated political debates at home when you uh, put your colours to the, the mast of the Conservative Party? Well, <clears throat> both my parents were very much of the left. Uh, I don't mean they were communists at all, but they were both very much of the left. So my, um, my father was, as you mentioned, um, a very staunch supporter of the Republican government in Spain. The Republic was declared in 1931. The monarchy was got rid of. And then there was a series of general elections uh, in Spain, um, uh, some of which were won by right of centre parties and some of which were run by left of centre parties. So the democracy was functioning reasonably well, but there was, there was a great deal of disorder and strikes and killings and so on. And in... Uh, July of 1936, there was a military rebellion, uh, which took a long time to be successful, but it led to three years of the Spanish Civil War. My father was involved with the government of the Republic, not as an elected person, but as a, um, you might say, a bureaucrat. And then eventually he had to walk out of Spain, literally walk out of Spain over the Pyrenees in um, 1939. So he was certainly at the left. I'll just note that he was, he was a strong Catholic, he was uh, vehemently anti-communist, um, and he was uh, vehemently against the death penalty, um, which was what he dedicated himself to. He was a professor of law, and so during the Spanish Civil War, he asked to be given the task of writing the pleas for the commutation of death sentences which had been passed under the Republic um, you know, on fascists. And in fact, he did his work so well that in the end he fell under suspicion. They said this fellow must be a fascist spy because who else would want to, you know, save these fascists from being um, shot. Um, my mother was, you know, just a, uh, a student at uh, Oxford, but she, she was a student of Spanish, so she became very interested in what was going on in Spain. You know, naturally she sympathised with the, with the left, with the Republic, and then she wanted to practice her Spanish, but she couldn't go to Spain because the civil war was going on. And some refugee children arrived from northern Spain, from the Basque country, and uh, some of them were sent to Oxford. There were about 4,000 children arrived on a single ship. Some of them were sent to Oxford. And my mother started making conversation with them. This was in 1937. And then my father arrived in 1939. He was a university man. He gravitated towards Oxford. He found out about the refugee children. He went there. My parents met. My mother proposed, and they married. <laughs> so that's all. All that is that background. Now, so I, uh, so I start my, my life with a poster of Harold Wilson on my bedroom wall. <laughs> I, I helped to run Labour Party committee rooms. 
um, in uh, you know, 64 and uh, 70. And then I go to uh, Cambridge and I start to see the world rather differently. Perhaps because of the people who taught me. But I emerged from that a conservative. What was my father's reaction to this? Well, my father was interested in democratic politics. I mean, what had shattered his life was a military coup, the ending of democratic politics. My, nothing would have pleased my father more himself than to have participated in democratic politics. So I think that's the context. You know, my father was not so much cross that I was a conservative as delighted that I had the opportunity to participate in democratic politics. And although in many ways he wasn't a particularly fair-minded man, he had a terrific love of language, both English and Spanish. And I remember in the early days, my father fairly soon got Alzheimer's, so it was quite a brief period of understanding what was going on. But I, um, I'd come back from the House of Commons with Hansard. And I was in the, in the House in the very early days with Enoch Powell. And Enoch made wonderful speeches in the House of Commons, in the most glorious English. And I would give these speeches to my father, and he'd say, but this English is just marvelous. You know, this debate, this rhetoric, that's, you know, so he loved all that. Um, so, so that's the context. Mm -hmm. And your mother? Um, oh, my, oh, yeah. Well, my, <laughs> she my mother was very amusing. So she, she moved from being Labour to being um, a Liberal Democrat, whatever that is. And, uh, <laughs> of course, she was an enthusiast. So I said, you know, we used to have committee rooms for the Labour Party in our house when I was a child. But it moved on that she supported the Liberal Democrats with equal passion. So um, when I would go to lunch there during elections, you know, I used to go to Sunday lunch every Sunday, and I'd go there during elections, her house was absolutely festooned in Liberal Democrat posters. You know, the garden was filled. You know these... <laughs> boards they put up, like for sale notices. And they were all the way down the garden path. You, <laughs> you couldn't see out of the bloody windows for these <laughs> Liberal Democrat posters. And I had to run the gauntlet of these Liberal Democrat posters. But, you know, when I lost my seat, she was so motherly. And for, for the rest of um, her life, she always used to say to me, but, you know, I know you're making, I know you're making these railway programs, darling, but what's your job? You know, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, listen, I would now like very much to invite members of our audience today to uh, pose their questions. What I would say is, uh, if you would care to ask a question, please put your hand up. And we have uh, uh, helpers here with microphones. And please keep your hand up to the microphone if I've uh, accepted your question at that point. So the microphone reaches you and we'll keep going until we get to the allotted time slot, which I think is taking us to just about half past two. So, who would like to... Okay, there's a gentleman there at the back. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk so far. I just was interested when you were talking about the Carlisle to Settle line, were you never involved in the Carlisle to Hoyt line? Okay, and I think what we'll do is we'll take two questions. Uh, the lady down here, please. And then Michael can deal with the two questions, and then we'll go back to the audience, if that's okay. There's a lady right down at the front here. I, re I really meant maybe I have the second mic. Oh. oh, is it live? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, for all you did in politics and your fantastic uh, <coughs> railway programmes. Um, two questions. So you gave a whoop when you were um, well, booted out in 97. So what made you go back? And also, what made you a Conservative after your because obviously that wasn't your tribal background from your family. Okay, yes. so um, one, I, I'm sort of getting confused. I, I think that's how we'll start. We might just go back to individual questions. But so, Michael, the first question was on the yes. extension uh, of Carl Carlisle to yes. No, I, I'm afraid it's just a, a no. I, I don't remember ever seeing an issue about that um, crossing my desk uh, all those years ago. Um, but the other one was what made me go back um, in uh, 1999 um, a mistake. It, it was, no, it, it was a mistake. And it was, um, it's the nearest I've come, I think, to having wasted years, because I was back in the house from 99 to 2005. And I think it was um, egotism, in a way, because I thought, you know, I would like to choose the moment when my parliamentary career comes to an end, rather than being hoiked out by the public 
Um, so I went back in 1999, but all the things I knew really, um, you know, that it would be miserable, that it would be horrible, that it would, well, they were all absolutely true. And it was, it was a miserable period of, uh, uh, of my existence. But from uh, having lost the leadership in 2001, I pretty quickly decided that I was going to leave. And, you know, fortunately, I began to do things like the This Week program, which were more or less compatible with being a member of parliament. So, you know, I began to set a trajectory for resuming my career in um, television because actually I made my first, let me get the chronology of this yet, right? Yes, I, I made my first railway program in 1998, which was um, not part of the series that I now do. It was part of a series called Great Railway Journeys, which had a different presenter each week. And I had done a program in that series in 1998 um, which is a railway journey across Spain, telling the story of my father's experience during the Spanish Civil War and using my uncles, my late father's brothers, as the witnesses. And this was, as you can imagine, a rather emotive programme and made a bit of an impact. And I was lucky enough that 10 years later, when a different company wanted to make a series about railways and history using a Bradshaw's guide, that someone at the BBC said, ah! I remember Michael Portillo made a railway journey in Spain 10 years ago. Let's get him to do it. Uh, and by the way, this, this is absolutely, I know there's some distance to the question now, but uh, this is absolutely amazing. Of course, the Spanish Civil War determined my father's life because it was the break point between his youth. He left at about age 32 or 33 and, and the rest of his life, which was living in England, trying to live in the English language and having five children by a British woman, Scottish woman. Um, but the Spanish Civil War has also determined my life. Because if I hadn't made that program about the Spanish Civil War uh, in 1998, I would not have been invited 10 years later to make series about railway journeys, which I've been doing for the last 15 years. And I find this absolutely amazing that as you go through life, you can never predict which acorn is going to fall from the tree and turn into an oak tree for you. you. You cannot predict the chances in life. You know, one day the telephone rings and they say, would you like to make a railway journey in Spain? And 10 years later, the telephone rings, would you like to make 15 years of series about railway journeys because you, you did this 10 years ago? Um, and why was I a conservative was the other question, really, wasn't it? Um, I think... Um, uh, initially, at least, and this is not a complete answer, but initially, I came to the view that I was a Conservative at a period when I thought the Labour Party was very washed up. Um, so although i had had a poster of Harold Wilson on my bedroom wall, he, let me get the chronology right, he had returned to power in 74. And I thought then the Labour Party was looking washed up. It was very in hock to the trade unions. Um, it, uh, uh, Tony Benn was playing a very important part in it and I also felt you know now that I was a, an adult I could open my eyes and make my own decisions and, um, and I decided to be a conservative then and, and funnily enough Tony Blair who's almost exactly the same age as I am I think would give you quite a similar answer but of course his conclusion would be different that you know circumstances of the time were quite important Thank you. Could we have our next question, please? Uh, so i take the lady uh, in the third row here. As someone who's got direct experience of, of Parliament, perhaps like Matthew Paris. You've just been um, switched off. Sorry, it's switched off. Uh, um, do you believe that the parliamentary system we have at the moment is irredeemably broken? Or will it, are we just on a cycle where it will repair itself? Michael, is it ir irretrievably broken? Uh, we're talking here about the UK, aren't we? I think, yes. Um, I think the um, UK system has extraordinary strengths and virtues. And I'm, I mean, some of them are too obvious to state, but let me tell you some of the things that I think really matter. I am really attracted by the one member, one constituency system. I think it produces a relationship between the Member of Parliament and the constituents 
which is really strong and really important. And the Member of Parliament really does feel that he or she has to represent all the constituents, whether they voted for him or her or not. And I just want to tell you how I see that translating. Most days, there are votes in the House of Commons. And you don't see this on television. You don't see how this works, because the camera looks at the chamber, and you see people milling around, and you've no idea what they're doing. But what they're doing is there's a central oblong chamber, and on each side of it, there are narrower oblong chambers. And one is for those voting yes, and the other is for those voting no. And so you can enter these chambers to either side of the main chamber through various doors, but you all come out, but you come out through one door, and they point in opposite directions. And there are doors at the exit which are held in that position so that only one person can pass, and you declare your name and the way you're voting, and you go through. It's like coming out of a sheet pen. Why does this matter? Because any member of parliament will know that he or she can talk to a minister at the vote. So if I'm a conservative and it's a conservative minister, I look in the long oblong lobby for the minister I want to talk to. <coughs> and I go up to the minister and I say, Mary, you cannot do this. I have been in my constituency this morning and you are ruining this business or that business or you're having this terrible effect on housing in my constituency. And literally, something that I've been told that morning in my constituency will be communicated to the minister that evening. And if I'm in the, if I'm, you know, at the moment in the Labour Party, I simply stand at the narrow exit of the other party and I wait for the minister to come out. And even though I'm from the opposite party, the minister will listen to me. And it will be the same conversation. I'll still say, Mary, you can't do this. I heard this. Michael. This is such an amazing strength to our system. And, and so I can't believe that the system is broken. Um, it, may, it may be going through a, a, a bad patch. But most of what I find about uh, the problems we have is a lack of leadership and a lack of belief. And, a, you know, leadership and belief, I think, would do a lot to resolve the situation. People are so timid. I, I went into politics to make decisions. The thing I loved doing was making decisions. I can't believe how many people today go into politics determined never to make a decision, either by postponing it forever or by subcontracting it to a committee or an inquiry or whatever, always avoiding decision-making. And um, this will be the first time, but probably not the last time, that we'll mention uh, Margaret Thatcher. But what was so extraordinary about her and what was so extraordinary about working for her was that she never doubted what she believed on any subject. If you ask me what I believe, I'll probably have to think about it for a while. But with her, you never had to ask. So we all knew what we were doing. Um, I'll give you an example. When we, were, when we were ministers under Margaret Thatcher, civil servants give you uh, bits of paper with decisions to be taken. And it's a, it's a bit like setting out a chemistry experiment at school. You know, they describe the methodology, they describe the background. And the, you, you get to the second page, and it says, there are three options for ministers A, B, C, we assume that ministers want to do A because it is consistent with government policy. The day after Margaret Thatcher left and John Major came in, the same bits of paper came out, you know, the argument, and then three options, A, B, C. And now the question was, what do ministers want to do? Because all sense of direction had been lost. So I think that is a bigger problem than a systemic issue. Can I, I, I'm going to go back to the, the lady who I was planning to pick and I would just say before I do so that of course you're all sitting at the desk that the MSPs will sit at and you have the consul there and that is where you vote in this parliament electronically and it takes about a minute, 30 seconds as opposed to perhaps 18 minutes per division in the House of Commons and if you have six votes back to back that's an awful lot of time and I remember when I was an MP but during the time that Michael was there, part of the time I often wondered, I heard the argument about buttonholing ministers, but I did often wonder why can't they just do it in their own time? But anyway, parking that issue there, to the lady there. 
Hi, my name is Kim. It's nice to meet you both. Thank you for having me and taking my question. As an American, my heart is broken with what's going on in my country, and I'm just interested to know if you were a politician in America, um, what party would you be on, and how do you, how do you see what's happening in in that country unfolding? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Over to you. I don't think I can give you uh, much of an answer, really. Um, if I were an American, I would be in despair about the choice. Um, and it seems simply unbelievable to me that the choice can be um, either um, a very elderly president, who I think is visibly losing his powers, um, or Donald Trump. Um, and there are things that I dislike about uh, both of them. I mean, as a conservative, I'm not going to tell you that I'm a keen Democrat. Um, particularly as I think the Democrats have moved a long way to the left in, um, in recent times. Um, and although Donald Trump um, understood and supported Brexit, um, I'm not going to tell you that I'm a, a Trumpite. So, and also, you know, we, we, I think we're quite unwise to comment too much about the politics of other countries, which we will understand very little. But what I will say, and it's a supplement to the last answer I gave to that gentleman, is there is a tragedy, I think, in the United States of polarization. And that, I don't think, has happened here. Um, we have had polarization on some subjects. Um, you know, Brexit was pretty divisive. But I don't think, in general, we are polarized. You know, on important matters of economic policy or social policy, or immigration policy, or whatever it may be, there's, there's a range of views, and I don't think we do have that polarization. So that's another reason why I don't think the British system is broken, because we don't have that polarization. And um, one of the things that's happened in the United States has been the gerrymandering of congressional boundaries, um, so that uh, you, know, you, you, you ensure that you're going to win a particular seat again and again and again. Uh, again, that is something that hasn't happened here. So we have this enormous, enormous ebb and flow of, um, between one election and another. You know, we are seriously imagining that a conservative government with a majority of 80 is going to lose the next election big time. Fantastic swing. So um, I, I, I think these are advantages we have over the United States at the moment. But more than that, I don't want to be drawn. Okay, uh, next question, please. Uh, gentleman uh, here. Hi, Michael. Uh, you seem to travel very light in your railway programmes. Was that a, a conscious decision at the start? And how many people uh, operate behind the scenes to take all your flamboyant um, <laughs> clothes and ensure they're so immaculate? Interesting um, question. It was, it was a decision at the beginning. <coughs> Um, I mean, there are many absurdities in television, um, and they are well represented in my programs. Um, so, for example, I get off a train, and the next thing you see is me walking up the driveway of a stately home or walking into a factory. Uh, that stately home or that factory could easily be 20 miles from the <laughs> railway station, and uh, no account has been given about how I got from one to the other. But... When we thought about the luggage, okay, you get on the train with the luggage, then you get off the train with the luggage, so now it's beginning to get in the way. And then what? You walk up the pathway to the stately home with the luggage, you walk into the factory with your luggage, you never get rid of the luggage. <laughs> so, absolutely, we decided not to have uh, luggage. And, of course, it's madly unrealistic. You even see me checking into hotels uh, with no luggage. Um, <laughs> also not having to present my credit card when I check in, you know, none of that. Here's, the, here's your key, Mr. Portello, off you go. No. So, um, now the luggage is not huge. I, um, a a medium-sized suitcase takes, um, on a 10-day shoot, five jackets, five trousers, and, five, and 10 shirts. So, each program takes two days to make, half-hour program takes two days to make. So, two shirts, the jacket, and the trousers. If the trousers are white, obviously a spare pair of trousers, because they'll get dirty. Um, and that's in a suitcase, and that's in a white van. And the white van is um, usually driven by a 21-year-old, 
whose, uh, whose job is to drive the van and also to carry the tripod. And the rest of the team, well, we have um, the director and the camera are the same person. And we have sound. We have a job which we normally call producer, which tends to be a woman under the age of 30, who is brilliant, you know, um, fairly recent graduate, will have such control over all the stories we're covering and the route we're going, and she's constantly messaging the people we're going to be talking to and rearranging things and adapting the program. That is the pivotal role. And then normally two runners, one who drives the van and the other who um, you know, helps out carrying the tripod around and so on and so on and so on. And that's it. So how many is that? I think it's six, is it? Um, so fairly light. You know, we, get, we fit into a smallish, a smallish um, van, um, a seven or a, or a nine-seater van with our luggage. And when I say luggage, of course, actually, some of the equipment is quite big. Uh, they're quite big cases. But we fit, in, we fit into a single van. So quite light. And I must say, the productivity of television compared with years ago um, ha has risen enormously. Uh, and that's not all advantageous. But, for example, when I, when I worked for the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer had to do the budget broadcast, the BBC sent about 15 people <laughs> to film the budget broadcast. Uh, and now, you know, we're six of us, and we, we make five programmes in, in 10 days, two and a half hours of television in 10 days. So rate of productivity is, is rather good. And the reason I say it's not all good is that the profession has been completely casualised. So all the people I work with... You know, you say goodbye to them on a Friday. Um, they may or, not be work may or may not be working the following week. They're living absolutely hand to mouth. And as one of them said to me the other day, I mean, uh, my producer, a woman in her, in her 20s, she said, um, you know, it was all right being freelance until, you know, in the last few months, my rent has gone up by 300 pounds a month. And, and now it's, you know, a much, much more difficult position than it was. So it's not altogether a happy industry, but it is quite an efficient one. Okay. Uh, gentleman uh, there. Yes, you, sir. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> was shocked and disappointed when I saw you walking him in here today. Following the other chap's uh, comment, uh, I had actually bet my wife had pounds that you would come in with purple trousers and a red jacket. <laughs> And I wondered truly, there must have been something that triggered you, whether you were a young person or whatever, to move into that mode. And are you a fashion icon or something else? Michael, fashion icon. Um, well, I, I, you have to imagine the psychiatric background to all of this. Um, you see, for many years, I was a repressed politician. I was wearing a dark blue suit and dark blue tie and white shirt every day. And, uh, you know, w once the British public gave me my sabbatical, uh, I burst free like a blossoming <laughs> flower. Uh, and, uh, and all these colours have come to the fore. But, but it may help you to know that I'm colourblind and that I dress, <laughs> dress in the dark. Um, now, it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned purple and red. <coughs> my, my basic clothing philosophy is to wear opposites. Um, actually, purple and yellow are opposites, I know that. But purple and red are, are pretty, pretty good contrast. So it's always a very sharp contrast. It will be yellow with blue, green with orange, etc., etc., etc. And, well, of course, it's just become a t talking point. It's just <laughs> one of the ways in which the, the programme gets noticed. But it's interesting. It, I, used to, I used to have what I called television clothes. I wouldn't dream of use, wearing them in my private life. But actually, that's now spilled over into my private <laughs> life. So I, I now dress like that all the time. And why am, I not, why am I not dressed like that now? You may not be able to see from where you are that I'm wearing a tartan uh, suit today as well as a tartan tie. So, um, yes. Um, w w w cult cultural appropriation, isn't it? So um, you can either be accused of cultural appropriation or I'd prefer you to think that out of respect for being in the Scottish Parliament today, I've worn tartan. Well, I think we'll, we'll take the latter. Thank you. Uh, the lady right at the back in the green uh, top. Buenas tardes, Michael. Um, I noticed in one of the railway programmes when you were doing Spain 
because I'm addicted to these programmes, you produced a Spanish passport. It made me think that in 2014, when we were going through the first referendum and the Conservative Party in England were all raving on that Brexit wasn't going to happen and we were going to stay in Europe and not to vote yes, um, and I believe you were one of the ones that said don't vote for independence. Now, you with a different European passport, how do you feel about it now? Have your thoughts changed since 2014 till now? Michael. 2014 being the, um, the Scottish referendum. Correct. Yes. Oh. Um, well, um, I absolutely believe in um, self-determination. Um, so, you know, if the Scottish people uh, choose to vote for independence, of course, I, I will respect that uh, in the same way as I respect the fact that the people of the United Kingdom um, voted for Brexit. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have an opinion. I mean, I, I very much believe in the strength of the United Kingdom and I would like to see it endure. But um, I perfectly accept that uh, from time to time, that's quite a big question in itself, that Scottish people should have the opportunity to vote on their future as, as any other people um, would. As far as my passport is concerned, um, well, it is true, of course, that because I have a Spanish passport, I've been less affected by Brexit than many people. And I do spend quite a lot of time in the European Union, not least because I have a home there. Um, and also, I film in the European Union a lot. And it would be inconvenient to me if I were restricted to 90 days out of 180 in the European Union. I'd, I don't think I'd often exceed that, but, you know, I might be on the cusp of it. So there's no doubt that my European Union passport is an advantage to me, and I use it whenever I travel to the European Union. So my British passport has no European stamps in it at all. But there we are, that's a fact of life. On the other hand, you might be struck by the fact that even though I have two nationalities, I was very much in favour of Brexit. And I think one of the reasons I was was that I felt I understood two nations quite well understood them so well that I thought they had, that they had no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That, their, that, that the shape of their politics, the culture of their politics was so completely different, their political assumptions so completely different that the idea of trying to govern them together seemed to me horrendous and that what it would lead to in particular would be an absolute lack of accountability and an absolute lack of democracy which is why I was in favour of um, leaving the European Union. But my reason for, for thinking that was not that I was a little Englander, rather the opposite, that I felt I knew Europe so well that I thought the idea of Europe being governed as a whole was dangerous nonsense. Okay, well, that's a very non-controversial <laughs> couple of subjects that we introduced there. Um, the lady here, yes? Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, I didn't used to be a fan of yours. In fact, I whooped as well when you lost your seat. I stayed up till five in the morning, I think, to watch it. <laughs> However, I'll qualify that by saying I'm a great fan of yours now from a number of your programmes. And the one I'd like to remind you of is when you, you lived with a family in the north of England for a week. And that actually is what changed my opinion of you. I was so impressed by how you helped the young boy try to give him some good social uh, values and upbringing. And I just wondered your recollection of that programme. Um, thank you for all your remarks. Uh, <laughs> let me see when that was. A long time ago. I think about 2001, maybe, something like that. So for a week, um, I moved into a house in the Wirral. And um, there were four children there, and I took over from their single mother parent, Jenny, for a week. Um, and I was living on 80 pounds for the week. Obviously, money of the day. Uh, and from that, I had to, you know, feed the children for the week and so on. And... Um, Michael, could I ask what ages were the children? Were they... uh, the children were... Oh, the, el the eldest was 12, and they, were, they went down every yeah. two years, you know, so 12, 10, 8, 6, I think, yeah. Maybe the youngest was 7. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure you could bake this program today, by the way, because, no, I mean, it raises a lot of ethical issues because, you know, obviously um, the mother signed the approval for the children to participate. I think even the father did because 
the, the father had not altogether disappeared. He, he didn't live in the house, but he hadn't disappeared. So I think both parents may have given approval, which is, you know, what you're required to do. But I don't think, I mean, I didn't think about it much at the time, but I do now. I don't think the ethical issues end there. And I have, um, from time to time, uh, met up with the eldest girl since. Um, she was 12 at the time, so she should now be about 30 or something. Maybe more. And, um, and she, she did say to me once, she said, what was it all about? What was it all about? So I, I, I have it slightly on my conscience, actually. Um, but it, it, made, it made an entertaining program at the time. Um, and it... A lot of it was entertainment. You know, for example, in the very first scene, we go to the supermarket for the first time uh, at, with all four children, and I think they'd been put up to it by the BBC. They rushed around the supermarket, seizing goods and throwing them into the basket, <laughs> so that by the first evening, I'd spent £28 pounds of my, of my uh, 80 for the week. And, um, you know, things like um, uh, going to buy a chicken and being recognised buying a chicken and... A woman saying to me, oh, what are you doing here, buying a chicken? You know, it, it, was, it was quite funny at the time. But, yeah, I, it was an interesting programme to make, and I'm not sure that it should be made again, quite honestly. Uh, next question, the gentleman at the back. Hi. Um, after so many years of travelling with the Bradshaws, do you now miss filming with a book? And also, um, is the plan for the next, ten, sorry, next few years, every decade, moving towards currently? What's the end of the question? Uh, is the next plan for the next few years? Are you just doing every, every decade until we get to the currently? Ah, I see. So, in case people aren't too familiar with this, um, we started these series using a guidebook called a Bradshaw's Guide, and there was one to Britain, which was jolly useful. That was about the Victorian era. Then, after a while, we found one to Europe, which was 1913. And so, um, the, thing, the stories that we were looking at were very much conditioned by the book. So in Britain, we were doing mainly Victorian stories. In Europe, we were doing mainly uh, either the First World War stories. And I must say, I thought this was very helpful. It was a fantastic perspective, fantastic um, theme to the program. Um, secretly, we used to say to ourselves, if only we could get rid of the book, we could make quite good programs here. <laughs> that, and the reason was that the book was not really as good as we cracked it up to be. Um, Bradshaw's guides, quite honestly, were written in a pretty shambolic and haphazard method, so that on some places you had masses of detail, and in other places you had almost nothing at all. And so we were trying to use things in the book to be our prompt, and we got down to, you know, using a single word. My Bradshaw's mentions crabs. Ah! I must go and investigate uh, fishing for crabs. Or, you know, it, it was getting very tenuous indeed. So actually, I'm quite pleased we got rid of the book. So w what we've done instead is in Britain we started doing coastal railway journeys and coast was quite a nice theme. And I must say, Britain looks at its best on its coasts in my view. If you're trying to film in British towns and villages and even cities, you've got so much traffic, so many parked cars, so many white vans, so much excrescence, so, many, so much signage. You try and film a beautiful building, it's almost impossible. The coasts, by contrast, are really pristine, and you can make beautiful television on the coast. So I've really enjoyed moving out of the cities and going to the coast. And the other thing we've done is we've done a series in Britain on post-war history. And since I have lived through most of the post-war period, it seemed reasonable, reasonable that I should be the guide. Um, so do I miss the book? No. And I'm very pleased that I think we've got on making you know, quite decent television. Yes, Lizzie. Sure. Um, I enjoyed your programme uh, in America last night. Um, I only managed the one. I'll watch the second one later. You were in a cowboy hat shop, trying on the hats. Oh yes. Did you buy one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you're, you're talking about Stetsons, aren't you? That's Stetsons. One. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. I'm, I mean, I didn't pay for it. Um, and, I, I, and I don't know where it is now. It's not in my possession, the Stetson. I, I think, um, you know how careful one has to be about 
you know, things that you don't pay for. So I think it's somewhere in the sort of archive of the television production company. But yes, I, I did buy a Stetson. And hat buying is always a very good sequence in, um, in these programs. You know, wherever you go, you can, you, you can imagine you can try lots and lots and lots, and you just cut the film like that so that one hat after another appears on your head. So it's always quite, quite entertaining. Next question. Yes, the lady here, and then I'll take the lead. Yes. Thank you for coming along today. You mentioned that you were, um, that it was miserable and difficult, and, and also mentioned some of the things that you relish, such as decision making. So I'm just curious what about being a, a, a politician was miserable? Oh. What was miserable what was about miserable? being a politician? Well, um, I mean, I'm certainly going to put it the other way around and say that most of my political career I really enjoyed. But I was very lucky. For most of my career, I was in government. And I'm not going to make any pretense to you. I enjoy being in government more than anything else. I enjoy being in my department, making decisions or travelling as a minister or whatever, much more than I did being in the House of Commons. And I enjoyed it more, I'm going to be very honest with you, than I enjoyed my constituency work. I did, I enjoyed being a minister. So, but the miserable thing was having been in government, being in opposition. Um, I mean, for example, after 2001, I wasn't in opposition because I was just a backbench member of parliament. I was no longer occupying a shadow position. And that was not particularly miserable because um, I, I didn't care whether I was relevant or irrelevant. But when I was shadow chancellor, that I did find uh, very miserable. So I was shadow chancellor for a couple of years, running up to the 2001 election. Gordon Brown was chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, everything was going well at the time. The economy was, you know, zooming along. Um, I would say that I think largely because they had stuck to the spending levels that we'd left behind, but that's kind of irrelevant. But the point was, we had no angle on labour at all. We had no way of attacking them. We, 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 we tried everything, but, you know, things were going well and Blair was popular and, you know, they still remembered how much they hated us and so on. So it was just a, it was just a, ve it was a very unfortunate time to try to do anything in opposition. Lydia, uh, yes, yourself. So your, oh, your, your history background seems to have been very formative in who you are today. And I wondered what's your perspective on some of the rhetoric we hear today against arts and humanities at universities and some of that leaning more towards maths and data and science and technology. Would you see that as a loss? And would you encourage young people today to still pursue, you know, arts, humanities, etc., given how formative it clearly has been on you and how you think and how you contribute to society? What's your uh, point of view? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I, I think my answer is that there should be many more people uh, who understand maths and science uh, and many fewer people like me. Um, and, 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 and I really mean that. I mean, I've, you know, there are lots of people like me who have made their way through life and very successfully um, have acquired fame and, and fortune simply by using words. That, that's all I do. I just, I just use words. And, you know, the whole television industry is full of people who, you know, just use words. And, you know, and they're clever, but they don't produce anything. I mean, they produce entertainment. They produce information. But, you know, they don't drive the GDP. They don't take us to a better world. They don't end pandemics. They don't get us to the moon. They don't solve the green crisis. So, no, I think my answer is definitely fewer people like me <laughs> and many more people not like me. Very honest answer. Uh, yes, the person here. Is there any sort of decisions that maybe you took that you maybe regret now that you would maybe do different at all when you not were a minister? Finally. I'm not finding the PA system too yes, sorry, easy. Sorry. Repeat your did, I heard sorry. The word was there anything that you did whilst you were in government, you took maybe key decisions that now you might take different if you were in government again? Um, I, I don't know specifically, but I will say this. 
I was first a minister when I was, I think I was first a minister when I was 31 or something. I may have got that wrong, 31. And I was last a minister when I was 43. I mentioned Tony Blair before. Tony Blair was first a minister of any kind at the age of 43, because we're born in the same month of the same year. So all the time when I was in government, uh, of course not prime minister, but he was in opposition. The first time he was a minister was when he was prime minister at 43. If it had been the other way around, if I had first become a minister at 43 and had done it for 11 years until I was 54, I believe I would have been a much better minister than I was. I think, quite honestly, I wasn't bad, but I think I would have been better. But there we are. Um, you, can't, you can't control these things. Uh, and you know, as I've already mentioned, I've been very lucky to go on and do other things. But I think it all came to me very early. Uh, so in a general way, uh, that is what I would regret. Not that I could have done anything differently and not that, I, <laughs> not that I wish it away. I very much enjoyed it, but I think I would have done better a bit later. Yes, Olivia. So I just wondered how you found working with the civil service. Uh, are you asking that from a particular perspective? Um, I used to work in Whitehall. <laughs> I didn't hear the... You used to work in Whitehall? You used to work in Whitehall. Well, um, if you did work in Whitehall, you, you may have a view about how I got on with civil servants. But my view of how I got on with civil servants was I thought I got on with them very well. Um, I valued them very much, and I met some outstanding people. I mean, even in those days, of course, we were frustrated, um, you know, that we couldn't do more, and we couldn't do things faster, and so on. But I go back to the point I made earlier about decision-making. I thought the job of a minister was to make a decision. And um, I was so lucky, I was a special advisor to Nigel Lawson, who I thought was an outstanding minister. And so, for example, he used to have these huge meetings to put together a budget. And you had to have a lot of people in the room because customs and excise would have a view and inland revenue would have a view and the Treasury civil servants would have a view and it would have consequences for public spending. So, you know, you'd have 17 people in the room. And Nigel would say, OK, I want your view on this topic. Should we do this or should we not do it? And he'd go around the entire table. And then one of two things would happen. He'd either say, well, 13 of you have said this and four of you have said the other. I didn't have a strong view in it. I'll go with the majority. Or he might equally say, my view was such and such. 13 of you have argued against me, but you have not convinced me. And I'm going to stick with what I thought in the first place. But thank you so much for challenging my view. And I thought this was such strength such intellectual self-confidence. And I decided that I would imitate him when I was a minister. So, you know, I would... I always began a meeting on time. I stated what the meeting was for. I made everyone participate. By the way, if they didn't participate, they weren't invited back. Everyone participated. We would end on time with me summing up the meeting, concluding points of action, who was going to take the action, and when we would next meet to discuss what we had agreed upon. And... As far as I know, that's kind of all being a minister is. And it's what the civil service needs. I don't know whether the civil servants in the room agreed with my decision or disagree with my decision. But what they needed was a decision. And then they could go forward. And then they would need another decision. And then they could go forward. So I think some of the problems are created by, by poor practice, actually. By poor practice. And, I mean, there was tremendous respect. I don't want to sound too elderly. But there was tremendous respect. Um, I'm going to men mention Margaret Thatcher again. We had, when we were in office, some pretty bad information officers in departments. You know, people who really weren't good at uh, putting across the government point of view to the press. And they were civil servants. They weren't political appointees. Margaret Thatcher would not allow us to change our information officers because she said it was a matter for the civil service who was to be the chief information officer not a matter for government. I mean, how different is that from today? But that was the respect that was um, held in those days. So I think, I think quite a lot has changed, but I don't think there's so much has changed that you couldn't have a proper working relationship between ministers and civil servants. Uh, the gentleman 
You've touched on this already, actually, but I just wondered if you could talk more about what it was like working with Mrs Thatcher, perhaps also towards the end of her premiership. Um, what, was it, what was it like working with Mrs Thatcher? Yeah, what was it like working with Mrs Thatcher? And, and towards the end of the premiership. Well, I've told you the good bit. The, the good bit was having a, a, a clear sense of direction. Um, the bad bit was a sort of day-to-day um, -day unreasonableness. So wh when I went to a meeting with the Prime Minister when it was Margaret Thatcher, I mugged up hugely. I made sure that I knew everything about the subject. And then I would arrive, and she would ask me something which I regarded as completely out of left field, something I couldn't possibly know the answer to. And then when I didn't know the answer, she'd say, well, how can we take decisions when you don't even know the answer to that? <laughs> And I thought, oh, you know, that is unreasonable. Or um, writing speeches for her, you know, you, it always went all night. And at about 3.30 in the morning, she'd throw down her pen and say, is there no one who can write a speech? <laughs> you, know, you just sweated the night out trying to write it. Is there no one? Get onto the Telegraph. Get onto the Times. There must be someone who could write a speech. So sometimes it was, there was ingratitude. Um, Sometimes it was just plain comic. I was a very junior minister, and I was in charge of some social security changes, which were very wide-ranging, and were going to be brought into effect. And there was a group of ministers sitting around the cabinet table, Margaret Thatcher there. She said, now, we must have some information for members of parliament so that they understand our changes. And I said, oh, well, actually, Prime Minister, I prepared some information. She said, oh, let me see, she said. So she took my bits of paper and blow me, she took out her red pen. <laughs> and she began to say, oh, this won't do at all. This won't do at all. This won't do at all. I said, Prime Minister, it's just a first draft. Let, let me take it back. And we ended up wrestling with this <laughs> bit of paper across the cabinet table. And all the more senior ministers around smirking because this <laughs> This smart Alec junior minister was being humiliated in this way. So it was a, it was a, very, it was a very varied sort of thing. But I was, I, 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 I was with her to the end. I was with her on the, on the day that... Oh, I'll just tell this anecdote, actually. Um, she, she was challenged for the leadership by Michael Heseltine. And she was infuriated about being challenged by Michael Heseltine. She, um, she thought he was showy, and she thought he was, well, she thought the whole thing was beneath her dignity. And so she decided not to campaign. She decided to go on being prime ministerial. So it was a very short campaign, and of course, only the members of parliament in those days who voted. So on the Friday, she was in Northern Ireland. On the Monday and the Tuesday, she was in Paris at a global summit. She did no campaigning at all. And... Um, on the Tuesday, the result came out. She hadn't got enough votes to win. She came back to London. She asked each member of the cabinet to see her individually, and each member of the cabinet told her that it was time to go. I wasn't yet in the cabinet, and I went to see her. Uh, and I said, um, I said, don't, uh, don't quit. And she said, but why? You know, everyone else has told me to quit. Why would you say any differently? And I said, because you haven't campaigned. I said, because you haven't asked a single member of parliament to vote for you. You haven't passed them in the corridor or picked up the phone or written them a note. And, and I believe that even at this late stage, if you were to invite some of them into your office and get them to look you in the eye, they would be carried out in tears and would still support you. And what was astonishing was she gave me a look that told me that she'd not even thought of this. And that, that was extraordinary. This woman who'd won three general election campaigns with huge majorities, she'd never even thought of campaigning to save her job, which I suppose tells you about what 11 years of power does to you. You lose, you lose sight of the ground, I think. But, I mean, it was, a, it was a, an amazing experience. Did, did, did anybody else to, uh, provide the advice that you had? Did you find sub out subsequently that anybody else had actually no, provided that I... advice that you had, Michael, or...? I, well, uh, yeah, there would, have been, there, would have, there would have been some, but I, when I delivered the advice, I was alone in the room. Mm -hmm. mm. And by the way, the advice was probably wrong. 
<laughs> no, I mean, it, no, looking back on it, it probably was wrong, but it was, it was what I thought at the, at the moment. Well, you know, so the, the only advice you can give is what you feel is best at the moment. Uh, do we have any? Uh, yes, uh, so I'll take the lady first and then the gentleman beside you. Um, thanks, Michael, for your talk. I'm the current chair of the Friends of Settle and Carlisle. So it's very nice to see our president here <laughs> and to hear that your uh, very complimentary remarks about us. And perhaps anyone who hasn't been to Settle Station should know that the letter reprieving the line is enlarged and framed and hanging in the booking hall for you all to see. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, um, the Conservative Party led the privatisation of the railways. Do you think that that has been a success? Undoubtedly. Um, no, I think, it, I think it was a success. Interestingly, it didn't happen under Margaret Thatcher. I don't know whether you remember that. Margaret Thatcher was not particularly in favour of privatising the railways. It happened under John Major. And I had worked on privatisation when I was the minister, but it didn't come to anything. And w amongst the models that we had considered and rejected was the model that eventually was implemented, which was independent operating companies operating over a single nationalised track. And we had said that that could never work. And that was what was implemented by the major government, my work having been done under the Thatcher government. So I was surprised. But I would just like to remind people that before privatisation, there were 700 million railway journeys made a year in this country. And by 2019, obviously pre-pandemic, there were 1.7 billion railway journeys made each year. So the number of railway journeys had more than doubled. It had gone up by a billion railway journeys a year from only 700 billion. This was an extraordinary transformation. And I remember that you know, when I was doing the settled Carlisle Railway, the assumption was that the railways were in terminal decline and that, you know, they'd be replaced by something else. And then this enormous increase in passengers came. Now, a lot of things happened in those years, but one of the things that happened was privatisation. And the reason why I think that may have been contributory was that the private companies did really want to have passengers. Uh, they, I mean, the nationalised companies, I think, were fairly indifferent to whether they had passengers or not, but the private companies did go for that. And the business of a railway is that, again, until the pandemic, you filled your trains twice a day, in the morning and the evening, but then the art was how you got people to use the trains the rest of the day. That's where the profit was. And what I think the private companies did with much more imagination was to fill the trains outside the rush hours. All of this is now ancient history because the rush hour has now more or less disappeared after COVID. And also because I think now the private companies are where British Rail used to be, which is that they don't care anymore whether they have any passengers or not. Um, and, and this happened during COVID. I mean, they loved COVID because they ran the trains all the time. There were no passengers on them. So no one, no one blocked a doorway. No one had an accident. No, you know, they, 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 they ran the schedule. They love not having passengers. Uh, and unfortunately, that's where the private companies have now got to. So I don't say that we shouldn't reform from where we were. But I'm certainly not um, misty-eyed about nationalisation. I, I was only minister for trains for two years, and I had to visit one disaster after another. I went to the Clapham Rail disaster where 32 people were killed. I went to a disaster in Milgai where about four people were killed. I went to a disaster... Um, just out, uh, Purley, Purley in South London. I went to three railway disasters in two years. Um, I came immediately after the King's Cross fire in which, you know, terrible numbers of people were killed. I had to fire the chairman and the chief executive of London Underground because their negligence had contributed to hundreds of, well, it wasn't hundreds, ten scores. I don't remember how many people died in the King's Cross fire. So I'm in no way misty-eyed about nationalisation. And we've now gone through a fantastic period of not having disasters on our railways. So before people decide that the answer is to go back to nationalisation, I think they should actually remember what things are like. 
And I'm going to take one last question in terms of time. And I, I, th I think I had said the gentleman, but I see that the, there's a gentleman very keen behind you who's put his hand straight up. So if I may, I might take this enthusiastic questioner. <laughs> I was just wondering who, which politicians you thought were the best at the present moment. I, I could see he had, obviously, some particular question in mind. I didn't know the question. Though. I can't think of any, and that might give us an opportunity. <laughs> that might give us an opportunity to have another question. What do you think? <laughs> well, he, that's, that was his answer. So I will go back to the gentleman who had, beside the lady there. Yes, yourself. Well, um, I was going to ask exactly the same question as the, as the lady sitting <laughs> next to me about railways, but I, I will say that the saving the set of the Carlisle was very forward-looking, because nowadays... Stations, even whole lines, are being opened and reopened. Okay. Yeah. Uh, back to let, 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 me, let me maybe go back to the previous question. Uh, I, I'm not sure how many names I'm going to mention, but the people I admire in politics are the people, people who believe something and are prepared to say it and are prepared to give some leadership. And it strikes me that there aren't very many in that category. Um, but, you know, those few who exist, they have my admiration. Not naming any names, though, I see. No, Mr. I Portillo. Won't. OK. Um, and if we could have a very last question, brief question, the lady at the back there. Yes. The, yourself, uh, you'll need the microphone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for coming up today uh, to speak to us. So you are sitting currently in the middle of what is a horseshoe-shaped debating chamber, um, which is, I think, designed to promote sort of consensual debate. But your career was actually centred around an uh, oppositional designed debating chamber. As an ordinary member of the public, it, it does feel like politicians spend most of their time in disagreement uh, very publicly quite often and it can be very tiresome for us to listen to. Do you feel that there should be more cooperation in political debate? Michael. Um, yes, I do. By the way, uh, I observe Scottish politics from a great distance, but I have not noticed that this hemisphere has produced unanimity amongst um, <laughs> Scots. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that the shape is quite as important as it seems. But, no, it is tiresome that uh, w one person says um, black and the other person says white, or perhaps one should say scarlet and purple or whatever. Um, that, no, that is tedious. Um, and actually, a lot of it isn't like that. I mean, I remember, you know, periods of substantial cooperation between the parties, I, and I very much doubt whether that is dead. It's just not something that, for some reason, they like to advertise very much. I mean, for example, I had a wonderful relationship with, um, with David Blunkett when he was my opposite number and I was doing local government. And we were constantly on the phone to each other to, you know, to talk about, well, sometimes to protect ourselves, you know. Uh, are you willing to accept this debate next week in Birmingham because the BBC have told me that you're going to be there? And, you know, so, but just stuff like that, just kind of working things through together. Um, so I think there's probably more of it than meets the eye. But certainly, I think um, more cooperation would be um, beneficial. I think a lot of it, uh, this may be a bad place to end, but I think a lot of it is not so much to do with the shape of the chamber as the nature of our media. I remember time and again going on with people and thinking, I'm going to agree with X or I'm going to agree with Y, and somehow being set up to disagree, set up to have opposite points of view. And you know, of course, that you know, before you appear on the media, they very often say to you, what's your view? And you say, this is my view. Oh, well, we no, um, okay, then we won't use you because it's not confrontational. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a little example. Uh, I, I was defense secretary and I had a, I had a lovely flat in uh, um, a building called Admiralty House, a building called Admiralty House. And after I'd left it, so, um, I think John Prescott was in the flat. And the BBC rang me up and they said, John Prescott is spending £80,000 on doing up this flat. Uh, aren't you outraged? I said, yes, I'm outraged because it needs about 150000 spending on it. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's got plastic avocado baths and it's got, um, it's got these fireplaces with a bulb and a fan that goes around. And this is an historic building and what we've done to it is a disgrace. And much more needs to be spent on it. Oh, yes, but we won't need to hear from you, Mr. Portillo. <laughs>
Well, that's it. It doesn't make the, the best box office, but it is uh, something that I think all politicians should uh, remember, that we are there, politicians are there to represent the constituents, for views, but to listen to other views and to, uh, uh, to ply their trade with courtesy and with respect. And certainly that's what I do try to foster when I'm in the chair. Uh, in the chamber, and as I said at the outset, uh, mostly with success, but sadly not on every single occasion. But I'm afraid that we have now come to the end of our discussion, and um, I would like to thank all of you for, uh, for coming along and for posing such interesting questions. I would like to thank our BSL uh, interpreters as well, and I would like to pay a special thanks to Michael Portillo uh, for engaging uh, with such uh, good humour in what has been a very wide-ranging uh, fascinating discussion uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much indeed Michael for giving up your time today thank you right, right. It, it's probably out of order for me to speak, but um, I thank you, Annabelle, very much indeed for chairing the session, all of you are coming. And just to mention that I'm signing books. Um, can, 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 can you tell them where I'm signing Yes, books? I was, I, honestly, I was, I, was, I was not forgetting. Um, oh, okay. So uh, Michael has kindly agreed to, to sign his most recent book, I believe, and that will take place downstairs, back in the garden lobby, where there's all the nice... Uh, coffee and cake available and also uh, other uh, features including uh, the signing of the book by Michael and there will be an opportunity to buy the book as well which is uh, something that I'm sure you'd all like to uh, take up the possibility of and that the, uh, the various uh, members of staff here today will assist you in getting from A to B um, and I would just lastly like to take this opportunity to remind everybody that uh, the Festival of Politics continues for the rest of today and for tomorrow. And, for example, later on today at five o'clock, I've been asked to say that uh, there's a discussion on the future of Scotland's art and culture. So that sounds a very interesting uh, 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 panel. And then also tomorrow there will be uh, further discussions on a number of issues, including... Uh, AI, I believe, migration, on Scotland's music venues and many other issues. So I hope that you might have a look at the programme to see if there's something that might attract you to uh, events later today or tomorrow. And lastly, I would just say thank you very much for coming along and have a very enjoyable rest of your day out in Edinburgh. Thank you. Thank you.